Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come even deeper into our hearts, our souls, our bodies, our spirit means. We give you full permission to do whatever it is that you are intending to do tonight. We thank you for the praise and worship that was enriching our souls, encouraging us, pushing us to go deeper and go higher in you. And Holy Spirit, as we go forth with this message tonight, we pray that it would be edification to our souls and you would cause us to understand our role in this hour. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight is going to be a little bit different. Um, we are going to bring you up to speed on some things that are going on that you need to be aware of that are going to affect you as far as your freedom of speech and your freedom of religion. So the title is Shall Not Infringe, <clears throat> and that's taken out of the Constitution. And you'll see as we go along tonight what we're going to be talking about. These things are vitally important for you to understand, first as a Christian, second as a citizen of the United States. History records throughout the annals of time that as societies advance, they decline into immorality. This should not be, and when you look at the safeguards that the founding fathers set up, you can get a sense that they wanted to avoid us falling like other nations. They did not want this to happen to us. We have been in one of the biggest cultural wars since 2008. This war has brought a decline in our society as we not only have lost all common sense, we have lost our moral compass. We have lost our moral compass, a sense of direction of where we're supposed to be heading and going. The American society was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. Despite what you hear in the news, we are not a Muslim country. We're not an atheistic country. We were based upon Jewish traditions. And if you look at the histories and the information from the founding fathers, they served God. They believed that you had to be a moral person to be in the government, period. Because if you weren't moral, you were going to be corrupt and you were going to do things corruptedly. So... Everything that they've done to rewrite history, to rewrite the, try to rewrite the Constitution is, is a lie. And you need to understand that and you need to walk with this knowledge that they were godly men. The American society was based upon Judeo-Christian values the values have not changed, but the definition of those values have changed. This is important to understand when you can change the meaning of words, you can change the culture of the society that those words are used in. When you change the meaning of words, you can change the culture of the society that those words are used in. There was a time when it was considered indecent to wear your bedclothes out in public. Slippers, pajamas, bathrobes are all on full display everywhere you go. There was a time when bathing suits that we wear today, I don't wear them, were considered completely indecent and inappropriate. Just a few examples. This seems like a harmless thing, but when you tie it to other areas where our society has changed, the meaning of words with each passing generation, there becomes a lessening of the standard. This standard becomes so diluted that it becomes pointless to even have a standard. Our American abundance has become a trap for us. The, the prosperity that we have, have had, it's, it literally has become a trap for us. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 5, verses 8 to 20. 
impending judgment on excesses. It starts out, woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place <clears throat> where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. In my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, truly, many, many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones without an inhabitant. For 10 acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield one ephah. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and flute and wine are in their feasts, but they do not regard the work of the Lord nor consider the operation of his hands. Verse 13, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitudes dried up with thirst. Therefore Sheol has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitudes and their pomp and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. Listen to this very carefully because this is showing you what has happened to our American society. Got lifted up in pride and we're going into captivity. Verse 15, <clears throat> people shall be brought down. Each man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture and in the waste places of the fat ones, strangers shall eat. Verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if it with a, as if it with a carp, cart rope, sorry that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So here we are today with the definition of words changing from moment to moment, the transition from good being called evil and evil being called good makes complete sense. And here this was prophesied by Isaiah way back in his time period. Look at the definition of woman. The original definition, an adult human female Female is a reference to biology, a person who has double X chromosomes and reproductive organs, ovaries, uterus, breasts, etc., that make bearing children possible. As of 2020, when you look up woman, this is the definition that you'll see. Cambridge Dictionary has recently amended its definition of a woman, an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they may have been said to have a different sex at birth. That's it, period. Completely different. When you start messing with definitions and changing things, you're setting yourself up for error. You can identify as a woman all day long if you don't have any of the parts. Reasonable people will say, that you cannot make a believable claim that you are, in fact, a woman. Bottom line, watch when people start redefining things because this can lead to good being called evil and evil being called good. There are some truths that, e that are eternal. They come from God and they can never be changed. So we're on this path talking about how societies go through a change that has been identified by anthropologists and sociologists as they have examined history. Listen at this information from some scientists. Few nations have lasted longer than 200 years, very few. 
the United States is approximately 247 years old. We are due for a collapse if nothing changes. A reset, as some people would say, in the church's future would be other large nations and empires in the West, the Holy Roman Empire, various colonial powers, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the French. It was once said that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now it does. As the West began a long decline, Napoleon made his move. Later, Hitler strove to build a German empire, then came the USSR. And prior to all this, in the Old Testament period, there had been the kingdom of David to be succeeded by Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. Eight stages of the rise and fall of civilizations. Stage number one, from bondage to spiritual growth. Great civilizations are formed in the crucible. The ancient Jews were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. The Christian faith in the church came out of 300 years of persecution. Western Christendom emerged from the chaotic conflicts during the decline of the Roman Empire and the movements of often fierce barbarian tribes. The American culture was formed by the injustices that grew in colonial times. Sufferings and injustices cause, even force, spiritual growth. Suffering brings wisdom and demands a spiritual discipline that seeks justice and solutions. We're in one of these time periods now. Step two, from spiritual growth to great courage. Having been steeled in the crucible of suffering, courage and the ability to endure great sacrifice come forth. Anointed leaders emerge and people are summoned to courage and sacrifice, including loss of life, in order to create a better, more just world for succeeding generations. People who have little or nothing also have little or nothing to lose and are often more willing to live for something more important than themselves and their own pleasure. A battle is begun, a battle requiring courage, discipline, and other virtues. Step three, stage three, from courage to liberty. As a result of the courageous fight, the foe is vanquished in liberty and greater justice emerges. At this point, a civilization comes forth rooted in its greatest ideals. Many who led the battle are still alive, and the legacy of those who are not is still fresh. Heroism and the virtues that brought about liberty are still esteemed. The ideals that were struggled for during the years in the crucible are still largely agreed upon. Stage four from liberty to abundance. Liberty ushers in greater prosperity because a civilization is still functioning with the virtues of sacrifice and hard work. But then comes the first danger, abundance. Things that are in too great an abundance tend to weigh us down and take on a life of their own. At the same time, the struggles that engender wisdom and steal the soul to proper discipline and priorities, move to the background. Jesus said that man's life does not consist in his possessions, but just try to tell that to people in a culture that starts to experience abundance. Such a culture is living on the fumes of earlier sacrifices. Its people become less and less willing to make such sacrifices. Ideals diminish in importance and abundance weighs down the souls of the citizens. The sacrifices, discipline, and virtues responsible for the thriving of the civilization are increasingly remote from the collective conscience. The enjoyment of their fruits become the focus. So we're in a time where we have come, the United States, in abundance. 
We sought liberty. You know, we sought freedom from the corruption of the English government. And we came here to this land because we were looking for religious freedom. We got that religious freedom. We fought for it. We, we sacrificed for it. We died for it. Then we came into a place in a time of abundance where everything that we wanted just, just prospered and grew. So here's the next stage. From abundance to complacency. To be complacent means to be self-satisfied and increasingly unaware of serious trends that undermine health, in the ability to thrive. Everything looks fine, so it must be fine. Yet foundations, resources, infrastructures, and necessary virtues are all crumbling. As virtues, disciplines, and ideals become ever more remote, those who raise alarms are labeled by the complacent as killjoys, or we would, we would call them doom and gloomers, today and considered extreme, harsh, or judgmental. So these things are happening right now to the prophets who are hearing from God because they're saying we need to straighten up, we need to get ourselves lined up. And people who don't want to do that are saying these things, oh you're a killjoy, you don't, you know, just just be quiet. Everything's fine. Everything's perfect. Complacency. So stage six from complacency to apathy. The word apathy comes from the Greek and refers to a lack of interest in or passion for the things that once animated and inspired. The, because of the things that have happened in this country, because of the things that have happened with the election, there is a danger for apathy to set in to the people. And as we're going to see tonight and some of the other things we're going to be talking about, each time they tell you to shut up and you do it and you don't resist, you don't sacrifice uh, your friends on Facebook, you don't sacrifice your political position, your church position in order to just be complacent with the crowd, you, we're losing something. We're losing our will, our resolve to fight and to keep that liberty that we once had, that was sacrificed for and people even died for. Due to the complacency of the previous stage, the growing lack of attention to disturbing trends advances to outright dismissal. This isn't happening. This isn't what, this isn't what they're talking about. Many seldom think or care about the sacrifices of previous generations and lose a sense that they must work for and contribute to the common good, civilization. Civilization suffers the serious blow of being replaced by personalization and privatization in growing degrees. Working and sacrificing for others becomes more remote. It changes from others to yourself. I'm only going to do for myself. I only care about myself. I'm not going to go vote. I'm not going to participate in society. I'm going to store up as much food as I can for myself. I'm going to get as many guns as I can. If anybody comes on my property, I'm blowing them away. Not, how can I help my neighbors? How can I help this government get back on track? We're seeing people being arrested for doing the right thing and serving long prison terms. Eventually, they're, this is going to be turned around. But what if this happens to you? Are you going to be willing to not be complacent and apathetic and sacrifice? Growing numbers becoming increasingly willing to live on the carcass of previous sacrifices. They park on someone else's dime, but will not fill the parking meter themselves. Hard work and self-discipline continue to erode. Stage seven, from apathy to dependence. Increasing numbers of people lack the virtues and zeal necessary to work and contribute. The suffering and the sacrifices that built a culture are now a distant memory. As discipline and work increasingly seem too hard, dependence grows. The collective culture now tips in the direction of dependence. Suffering of any sort seems intolerable. 
but virtue is not seen as the solution. Having lived on the sacrifices of others for years, the civilization now insists that others must solve their woes. You're becoming dependent upon the government to fix everything for you. This is not what the founding fathers intended. They saw all of this when they put this country together and they fought to work against it. This ushers in growing demands for governmental collective solutions. It's the government's job to protect the citizens, so we're going to shut the whole country down. You can't move, you can't do anything without our permission. What did that ultimately cause? One of the biggest mental health crises that our youth have ever experienced and are still experiencing. What else did that cause? That caused many people who had small businesses to lose out and eventually shut those businesses down to never return back to the economy again because they were just outdone by the bigger companies who could staff people, who could get the supplies. All of these little things that we don't consider and think about are contributing to the destruction of our society and the destruction of the United States. This in turn deepens dependence as solutions move from personal virtue and local family-based sacrifices to centralize ones. Stage eight, the final stage, from dependence back to bondage. As dependence increases, so does centralized power. Dependence, dependent people tend to become increasingly dysfunctional and desperate. They don't have the common sense that they used to have because they didn't work for it to get it, to earn it, to live in it. Seeking a savior, they look to strong central leadership, but centralized power corrupts and tends to usher in increasing intrusion by centralized power. Injustice and intrusion multiplies, but those in bondage know of no other solutions. Family and personal virtue, essential ingredients for any civilization, are now effectively replaced by an increasingly dark and despotic centralized control, hungry for more and more power. In this way, the civilization is gradually ended because people in bondage no longer have the virtues necessary to fight. Because people in bondage no longer have the virtues necessary to fight. Another possibility is that a more powerful nation or group is able to enter by invasion or replacement and destroy that final vestiges of a decadent civilization and replace it with their own culture. I want to read that again. Another possibility is that a more powerful nation or group is able to enter by invasion or replacement. So let's talk about the border wall that is virtually non-existent. Let's talk about the entrance of certain cultures from Ukraine, certain cultures from Afghanistan, certain cultures from the Islamic religion that have moved in and have taken over different areas of the government. They are in the local town governments. They are in the local city governments, and they are running things. So by, either by invasion or replacement, our society is being destroyed, and they destroy the final vestiges of a decadent civilization and replace it with their own culture. Either way, it's back to crucible until suffering and conflict bring about enough of the wisdom, virtue, and courage necessary to begin a new civilization that will rise from the ashes. So we're, we are in and working through these different stages right now as we speak. Can you see the United States fitting into this pattern? We are on a path that necessitates change. So let's talk about your rights as a citizen of the United States. Governing rule of law in the United States is the Constitution, the fundamental law of the U.S. federal system of government. 
It is the oldest written national constitution in use. The constitution defines the principal organs of government and their jurisdictions and the basic rights of citizens. One of those definitions comes from the First Amendment. The First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are your rights as an American citizen. You have those. You need to know those. You need to know that you're allowed to practice your religion. You need to know that you're allowed to say what you feel without fear of retribution coming from the government. But we have learned since COVID that there's certain things that they do not want you to say. And if you say those things, they silence you. If they don't silence you, they put people in your social media feed to harass you. If you're not aware of this since 2008, you, have, you as a Christian have been placed on a terrorist watch list. And we've talked about this in here before, but just for the sake of those who don't know, you're on the watch list. If you homeschool, if you exercise your right to bear arms, if you side with anything that is contrary to what the elitists believe, they are watching you. They have slowly been silencing us and restricting our ability to have our freedoms of speech. Obama made it a policy to do this. This is a quote. The fact is Obama is uncomfortable with America's Christian heritage. In 2010, he could not bring himself to utter the words, in God we trust, when speaking in Indonesia about our national motto, Instead, he substituted e pluribus unum, but he is quite comfortable with atheists. In 2010, Obama became the first president in U.S. history to welcome a gathering of atheists. Administration official, officials met with activists from the Secular Coalition for America, an umbrella group that includes American atheists and other very virulently anti-Christian organizations. Until 2012, every Democratic Party platform made some reference to God, but things changed in that year, demonstrating once again that the administration has a God problem. In 2008, the platform mentioned that government gives everyone willing to work hard the chance to make most of their God-given potential. The italics, which I added, were deleted from the 2012 platform. Worse, when CNN's Pierce Morgan asked the Dem Democratic National Committee Chair Rep Debbie Wasserman Schultz why someone deliberately excised the word God, she replied, I can assure you that no one has deliberately taken God out of the platform. After listening to this remarkable response, Morgan pressed her again, asking, so it was an accident? She refused to comment. This stuff's been going on in the background. It was this systematic approach by Obama and his team that moved us to where we are today. No one dares say anything about Christianity or Muslim extremists or you will be shut down. We put out a sermon where Brett was preaching and he said something about the vaccine and they shut us down on YouTube twice now for doing that. So our rights are being restricted more and more and like the frog that is in the pot with the water being turned up to boil, our society is being changed. If you say anything about the election of 2020 on social media platforms, you're instantly fact-checked by someone who is monitoring your sites. So we all know that President Trump is being tried on multiple counts in federal courts. He's got four cases that are against him pending. They're trying to silence him. Anyone who tries to defend President Trump or speak out against what has happened is targeted and attacked. They are trying to silence anyone who will stand with him. 
Politics is dirty business. What is supposed to be happening is the party that you're working with is supposed to be the one to take the heat off the candidate. In order to keep the candidate from doing the hard, dirty work, the party chair is supposed to make statements to the press, fight for the injustices against the candidate, and make him look good. We don't have this for President Trump. They, the party, is letting him defend himself. The party is there to collect the money from the donors, but they're not doing their job to protect him. So President Trump has been mischaracterized in the media repeatedly. If they show pictures of him, they distort his face, hair color, make him look angry when he is not angry. They are saying that President Trump said and did things that he did not do. And they put those articles and those videos on repeat and people believe them. You cannot convince them that he did not say the things that, that they're saying he said. And it's, it's one of the, the most demonic things that's going on right now against him. Everything is being done to silence him. So if the party isn't speaking up for him, his friends are afraid to speak up for him. Who is left to stand up and defend him? He has to do all of this by himself. These court cases that, ha that they have against him, the newest attack against President Trump is for the court judges to place a gag order on President Trump. What is a gag order according to Cornell Law University? A gag order is the term for when a judge prohibits the attorneys, parties, or witnesses in a pending lawsuit or criminal prosecution from talking about the case to the public. A gag order is issued by a judge and generally prohibits someone from talking about a legal case or aspects of one. Defense lawyers, as opposed to the defendants, and President Trump is the defendant, are the ones that they usually put the gag orders against. They're often the recipients of these gag orders, according to Anna Kaminsky, a law professor at New York Law School. It would usually be an attorney because defendants typically are not doing the talking because everything they say can be used against them in a court of law. U.S. Dich District Judge Tanya S. Chutkin has issued a limited gag order against Donald Trump that prohibits the former president from disparaging prosecutors witnesses and court personnel involved in his upcoming election obstruction trial in federal court in Washington, D.C. As Chuck can put it in her order, in order to safeguard the integrity of these proceedings, it is necessary to impose certain restrictions on public statements by interested parties. This isn't right. This isn't right. This is not fair. And this is violating his constitutional rights. In early October, the New York judge overseeing a civil trial over alleged business fraud committed by Trump and his company issued another gag order. The gag order prohibited Trump from making public comments about staff in a Manhattan courthouse. It came soon after Trump posted a photo of one of the judge's employees on social media along with a critical message. The New York judge fined President Trump $5,000 on October 20th because at least one copy of that message remained on the former president's website. So they're doing everything that they can to harass and limit what he has to say. And no one that has stood with him uh, on his staff, they're attacking all of his staff, all of his lawyers right now, and they have... They have, some of them have made the decision that they're going to just give up. There's that much pressure upon them to, to do that because they don't want to spend 20, 25 years in jail. So the reason that this is done is to ensure that President Donald J. Trump gets a fair trial, supposedly. In the climate that we live in today, is it reasonable to believe that President Trump is going to get a fair trial? No. The media has been doing everything in its power to make President Trump look crazy. 
President Trump has been placed in a position where he has to defend himself. There is no one that is coming to save him. The same is true with you. You need to get this mindset right now. No one is coming to save you. When you start making statements, you start telling the truth about the Bible, the gospel, President Trump, there's not going to be anyone that's going to come and say, yeah, they're right. We agree with them. Because everyone is afraid of what can be done, being cast into jail. Many people in the church are mad with President Trump, but they don't understand how systematic these attacks have been against him. They still want President Trump to be a peacemaker. If he does this, we all lose. He's got to fight. He's got to stand up because no one else is able to do it. Obama has said that he wants to silence all of us. And I keep bringing up Obama because he's in the background doing things right now as we speak. If they are successful at silencing President Trump, we are next, and Obama will complete what he started out doing in 2008. Judge Tanya Chutkin's gag order on former President Donald Trump has conjured a storm of fierce political and legal debate while raising criti critical questions about the future of America's electoral process. The ultimate impact of her order remains to be seen but she appears to have broken new ground. You hear this? New ground. This, she's doing something that she should not be doing in regulating how presidential contenders can address widely publicized legal challenges that are likely to serve integral parts of both contenders and their opponents campaigning. While she said President Trump could continue broadly criticizing the administration in Washington, she sought to limit his ability to criticize court personnel, special counsel Jack Smith's team, and potential witnesses. You have a right to confront, according to the Constitution, those people who are accusing you. And they're denying him that right. Issued on October 17th, the text of Judge Chutkin's ruling reiterates her concern about President Trump provoking harassment of key figures involved in the case. Undisputed testimony cited by the government demonstrates that when defendant has publicly attacked individuals, including on matters related to this case, those individuals are constantly, cons consequently threatened and harassed, she wrote. So she's saying because he's saying something that people are harassing and threatening these people. This is not happening. Since his indictment, and even after the government filed the instant motion, the defendant has continued to make similar statements attacking individuals involved in the judicial process, including potential witnesses, prosecutors, and court staff. The defendant has made those statements to national audiences using language, communicating not merely that he believes the process to be Ill illegitimate, but also that particular individuals involved in it are liars or thugs or deserve death. The court finds that such statements pose a significant and immediate risk that witnesses will be intimidated or otherwise unduly influenced by the prospect of being themselves targeted for harassment or threats and attorneys, public servants and other court st staff will themselves become targets for threats and harassments. This is her, her thought process and reasoning for doing this, which is completely illegal. The order by Judge Chutkin was appointed, who was appointed, get this, by President Barack Obama, prompted widespread accusations that Democrats were committing a form of election interference. The politicized prosecution is designed to derail his ability to win re-election and when the judge silences him in his ability to defend himself publicly, then she is doing the work of his political enemies for them, said Roger Severino, who serves as vice president of domestic policy at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Severino led the Health and Human Services Department's Office of Civil Rights under President Trump and previously served as a trial attorney at the Department of Justice. We used to not live in a banana republic where the Department of Justice was weaponized and politicized, he said. 
it has been weaponized and politicized, so now it needs to be restored. And that's part of his campaign. And now he has to look over his shoulder because the judge is going to be watching every word he says on that issue. Everything she is doing in this order will have an impact on the campaign from his fundraising to his political speech. It's also unclear what exactly President Trump can't say. So no matter what he does, they're, they're going to get him. If anything about Mr. Smith, whom Mr. Laurel called out on October 16th for announcing the indictment with rhetoric that he alleged was intended to prejudice the jury pool, Mr. Smith's statements are some of the many to which Mr. Laurel thinks President Trump should be able to respond. M Mr. Smith notably accused the former president of lies targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the United States government the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. Trump has shown himself to be particularly likely to abuse his free speech rights. How do you abuse your own free speech rights? Unreal. Particularly likely to dis disregard judicial instructions short of a gag order, and particularly inclined to pervert the entire process to his own advantage however he can. Of course, that doesn't justify silencing him entirely or entering an overboard gag order that sweeps more broadly than strictly necessary to prevent Trump from undermining the proceeding or threatening the safety or efficacy of the participants. But it may well mean that judges will be less inclined to give Trump the benefit of the doubt than they might to other defendants. Properly so, in my judgment, given his unapologetic bad faith throughout. Brett, I want to jump down to... There's one that says it's happening here in Delaware. While Brett's trying to find that, <clears throat> these things are not limited to President Trump. They're affecting us here in, in Delaware. Churches in Delaware finally got wise. In December 2021, pastors sued Governor Carney to enforce freedom to worship. Now, this was the result of a second lawsuit that was filed against Governor Carney because of what happened during COVID-19 in the beginning when they shut all, when they shut all the churches down and limited to, them to uh, 10 people. Two Delaware pastors are suing Governor Carney to enforce their right to worship freely. This is a constitutional right, as we just, just read. While places of worship were considered essential under Governor Carney's emergency orders, religious leaders had to follow strict guidelines, which included tight capacity restrictions, mass requirements, and cleaning rules. While those restrictions have since lifted, two pastors are seeking to bar any governor from restricting anything to do with religion in the future, claiming the state constitution has provided such rights since the very beginning. Thomas Crumpler, who represents Reverend David Landau from Wilmington, says the state has no right to interfere in anything churches do. The government has absolutely no right under our system to interfere with how the church operates they can give guidelines and the church which cares about its brothers and sisters, they're going to want to protect them, but that should be up to the church to decide, not the governor. Thomas Newberger, who represents Reverend Alan Hines from Townsend, says, Delaware's Bill of Rights often provides more freedoms than the federal government gives. Our Delaware courts hopefully are not going to be bound by the federal rule, said Newberger. They'll look at it, but they'll, they'll say our founders had something more in mind than the feds. That only had like 16 words. The article states that the government can't restrict the rights of people to freely exercise their religion, but doesn't define what a free exercise of religious worship is. So they're trying to find loopholes to shut churches down in, in the event that there's another episode or, or breakout. So this court case um, was eventually thrown out because of language and wording. Brett, I want you to skip down to November 2020. 
but they're still fighting it. And it's good to see that there's still people who are willing to not be apathetic and dependent upon, you know, other people to, to help them. They're willing to make the sacrifice and put their names out on the line. November 2020, a federal lawsuit challenging restrictions on houses of worship imposed by Delaware Governor John Carney at the start of the pandemic has been settled. In exchange for the Reverend Christopher Bullock dropping his lawsuit, Carney agreed that in any future emergency requiring state actions, the governor must treat churches and religious worship in a neutral manner. This also means places of worship will be treated like all other citizens and properties and not be singled out. It's time to move on, Bullock said. We need to heal our country and heal our state. And the Church of Jesus Christ stands on a sure foundation. Bullock, pastor of Canaan Baptist Church, filed his lawsuit in May, about two months after Carney imposed COVID-19 restrictions across the state. The restrictions on communities of worship that Bullock took issue with included the preparation and distribution of communion, no holding or touching during baptisms, the clergy, clergy having to wear a mask while preaching, the amount of people allowed in places of worship during services. Under the settlement, the state is forbidden to impose a 10-person attendance limit only on houses of worship and if essential businesses or essential activities are listed in the future, churches will be included as essential. Other requirements in the settlement include no age-based attendance limits can be imposed solely on religious worship, mask wearing and social distancing cannot be applied solely to churches, no church can be limited to just one service a week, no limits on others' use of building can be imposed solely on churches, such as its other charitable ministries. No specific time limit on length of service can be imposed solely on church use of its building. And in closing tonight, <clears throat> this, this made the national headlines, and we talked about it, but just bring this back up again. Rodney Howard Brown was arrested because they kept and continued to hold church. These things that we're talking about are real. You need to understand them. Florida pastor arrested after holding church services despite coronavirus orders. Rodney Howard Brown of the River at Tampa Bay allegedly showed reckless disregard for human life and put hundreds of people from his congregation at risk. Sheriff's deputies on Monday, this was March 30th, 2020, arrested the head of a Florida church, accusing him of ignoring local orders against mass gatherings due to, to the coronavirus pandemic and showing reckless disregard for human life, authorities said. The river at Tampa Bay Church held services over the weekend, and Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Cronister said he had no choice but to take action against the pastor, Rodney Howard Brown. Last night, I made the decision to seek an arrest warrant for the pastor of a local church who intentionally and repeatedly chose to disregard the orders set in place by our president, our governor, the CDC, and the Hillsborough County Emergency Policy Group, Chronister told reporters. His reckless disregard for human life put hundreds of people from his congregation at risk and thousands of residents who may interact with them this week. Chronister said his office had direct contact with the church, telling it not to pack its pews. Dr. Rodney Howard Brown refused requests to temporarily stop holding large gatherings at his church, and instead he was encouraging his large congregation to meet at his church. Pastor Howard Brown's actions were a direct violation of Executive Order 20-5, which went into effect on March 20th, limiting gatherings, including face-based gatherings, to less than 10 people. The NBC affiliate reported Sunday night that church doors were open with streams of cars pulling in and out of its parking lot. And you get the point of that. We are living in a time where we need to understand what our rights are, and you need to make a decision. Are you going to stand up for those rights, or are you going to bow your knee to the enemy? I was, you know, when when they first started messing with us here, Pastor Barbara was like, we're not closing our doors. 
God told us not to close the doors, and we did not. We held services. So, so many churches in Delaware closed because they lost the people. They lost their congregations because they did not understand their rights. They did not listen to the Holy Spirit and do what the Holy Spirit commanded them to do. So these are very serious things that we wanted to bring to your attention. One, so that you would have the information and you, you would know what's going on and be refreshed. There's a lot of things that are going on right now in the spirit realm, and you need to be aware that you as a Christian are being targeted. You're being targeted to be silenced. You're being targeted to be uh, pushed away and, and pushed out of your walk with God. There's, there's just so many different things that are going on. These are things that you're not to be afraid of. You just need to be aware of them. And, you know, we're coming into the time where you may get your head cut off. You, you may be confronted with that real possibility right now. What are you going to do? Are you going to be bold and say, I'm just going to die and be, be with Jesus? Or are you going to say, nope, not me, and deny Christ? You, you have to understand how serious this is and where God has taken us to. The good thing is persecution grows the church. And we're seeing that in different places in China different places around the world where they're being persecuted, the church is on fire. So here it is. This is revival. This is revival, and this is what it, what it is looking like for us. Father, I thank you for everything that was brought out tonight. I pray that it would go deep within the hearts and the souls of your people. I pray, Father God, that the Holy Spirit would seal these things in, that you would increase our boldness, you would increase the words that we speak to people and let us not be afraid of the things that are happening in this hour. And Father, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.